Night Call, as well as all of the missions included in the base game of Hitman 2, was released on November 13th, 2018. As I've mentioned previously, the World of Assassination trilogy was originally envisioned as an episodic series, with what I've covered so far as Hitman 1 being the first season, which would launch into a second and eventually a third. However, due to Square Enix's dissatisfaction with the first season's sales, they no longer wanted to move forward with the series. IOI left Square Enix becoming an independent entity, and going to a new publisher, Warner Brothers. Under this new direction, Hitman 2 would no longer follow the episodic release schedule, but would instead be released as a full game. This is why Hitman 2 is not a radical departure from the first game. In fact, one of the criticisms sometimes leveled at it is that it's fundamentally more of the same more of a level pack than a sequel. All of the levels from the first game port directly into the second, and all of the levels from the first two port directly into the third, which results in the original goal of one massive game finally being realized here in 2023. I don't consider it being more of the same to be a weakness at all. I consider it to be a strength, because Hitman 2 is, in my opinion, the best game in the trilogy by far. The levels are bigger and better. Every single one is a masterpiece. The settings are all interesting and distinct, the situations you find in them extremely memorable. I love Hitman 1 and Hitman 3, but Hitman 2 has always been why I'm making this series, to focus on just how wonderful these levels really are. Not just that, but the sense of humor of the game absolutely took off in the second one. As hilarious as many of the moments in the first game are, the second game took every opportunity to up the ante, with better jokes, weirder moments, and putting Agent 47 in just so, so many silly outfits. It's truly wonderful. That all begins with Night Call, set on a beach in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. Night Call opens with a cinematic recap of the story so far. After spending much of the first game being manipulated by the Shadow Client in his war on Providence, and then retaliating against both sides in order to send a message that the ICA is a neutral party, the Constant, a Providence higher-up, convinced Agent 47 and Diana to work with Providence willingly, with the promise of information about Agent 47's mysterious past. Now, Agent 47 and Diana have tracked down one of the Resistance's remaining leaders, Alma Raynard, to a secluded beach house in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. Your primary objective here actually isn't to take Raynard out, but rather to gather information about the Shadow Client's militia, and hopefully, the Shadow Client himself. While the rest of the missions in Hitman 2 are the biggest in the series, Night Call chooses to open the game with a much smaller and more intimate setting. Not only is Raynard the only target, but the map is incredibly small, closer to the scale of the tutorial missions from the very beginning of the first game than even the smallest main maps like Paris or Bangkok. This is essentially Hitman 2's tutorial mission, Although it's less of a full tutorial, as the ICA facility missions are still included, and more designed to allow the player to get reacquainted with the core gameplay, as well as highlighting a few of the major features added between Hitman 1 and 2, such as foliage, picture-in-picture, -picture, and visible sightlines for the security cameras. The mission is also less freeform, at least on your first playthrough. While it's still up to you how to ultimately take Raynard out, the mission is much more, for lack of a better word, cinematic than any of the first game's missions. That's not a negative, though. I actually think it works extremely well in context, especially since the actual way you take Raynard out is less directed than most other maps, since there are no mission stories in this mission, requiring the player to improvise something. 
The mission begins with 47 pulling up in his speedboat just down the beach from the house, an absolutely jaw-dropping visual that emphasizes just how excellent both the graphical fidelity and art direction of the game is. Most of the map by volume is empty, a huge expanse of deserted, windswept beach. From the skybox to the particles of sand in the air, it's immediately apparent what a step up in graphical quality this game is from the already stunning first game. As you approach the house, you realize that it's dark, and that Agent 47 has arrived when no one is home. Raynard and her men are all out on some sort of errand, which we'll discover a little later on. One of the biggest changes between the maps of the first and second games is how much more dynamic the maps are in terms of changing over time. While there were missable opportunities in the first game, they tended to be very small changes, like missing out on becoming Sheik Al-Ghazali in Paris, or significant one-time events like Helmut Kruger eventually walking the catwalk. But, while these events were notable, the actual target's behaviors were on relatively static routines, unless prompted by the player directly. In contrast, several of the levels in Hitman 2 have significant changes to the environment and target behavior as time goes on. This can either be from literal time passing, as we'll see in the Miami level next time, or from some sort of event trigger being hit by progressing through the mission. We saw them testing this idea with the Patient Zero campaign, with Sister Yildiz changing her behavior and position entirely if Nabazov is killed first in the Source, or Craig Black and Brother Akram eventually meeting in the graveyard and attempting to escape the mission if enough time passes during the author. When Nightcall begins, the home is completely abandoned, giving the mission a wholly unique feel in the context of the game so far. There's a very specific and different thrill poking around a deserted house while the occupants are out, and a tense feeling that someone might walk in on you at any moment, even if you know what the actual trigger that causes them to return is. It also offers the player the opportunity to poke around the house, and if you're clever, prepare an assassination before the target has even arrived in the level. The exterior of the house is monitored by security cameras, which will catch the player's eye immediately if they're coming to this directly from the first game, as they are dramatically easier to see now that there's visible sight lines showing where you'll be caught on camera. These can be easily taken out with 47's silenced pistol. The house is sleek and modern. There are several potential points of entry, most of which require you to use your lockpick to break in. You can easily pick the lock on the front door near the first security camera you'll naturally come across. Moving clockwise around the house, they've left the sliding glass door to the beach house open, and you can freely enter it. There's a small pot in the corner of the beach house, and if you break it, you'll find that they keep a spare key hidden in it, which gives you free access to any of the house's entrances, including the door from the pool house into the main room of the house. At the back of the house is another entrance, a back door by the dumpster, which can be picked to enter a sort of pantry hall connecting the main living space and garage, as well as a stairwell. Circling back to the front of the house is the garage door. Just next to this is a pipe, which can be shimmied up in order to enter from the second floor balcony, but you can also pick the garage door panel in order to open the garage. If you enter from this way, you'll get one of the best surprise moments of the mission, as the door opens to reveal two dead bodies, civilians who were kidnapped, tortured, and then killed by Raynard and her men. Diana speculates on who these two are, suggesting Raynard may have stolen their identities in order to more easily blend in here in New Zealand. If you open up the door of the van here, you can discover more tools for kidnapping. Masks, rope, 
chloroform, indicating that whatever mission they're on here in New Zealand, it isn't over yet. The garage connects to the aforementioned hallway, and to the main living space of the house, sort of a shared kitchen and living room that forms the bulk of the house. When you enter this room, you find that a projector has been left on, bathing the dark room in the bright, moving light of a TV screen. It gives the whole room a sort of sinister feeling to me, a weird and unnerving feeling of walking into a dark room with the TV playing. You can also find a grand piano here and a brightly lit aquarium in the small hallway next to the pool room entrance. By the grand piano, you can find a door leading to a smaller sort of lounge area, with a couch, a drink cart, and some bookshelves. This connects to the first floor bathroom, which wraps back around into the main living space. Traveling upstairs, you find a large walkway overlooking the main room, which connects to various sections of the second floor. A small upstairs loft area leads into Reynard's bedroom and the master bathroom and walk-in closet. The closet is full of trendy clothes, the kind you'd see at a sanguine store, and also includes a curtain that Agent 47 can hide behind, which is useful for some of the mission's noteworthy kills, as well as for later observing dialogue. The large master bathroom has both a standing tub as well as a shower. Also, their sink is a super interesting design. I kind of dig the slanted, recessed look to it. The bedroom has a small lounge area to it, as well as a TV and, of course, Raynard's bed. It also has some extremely creepy and evocative artwork. I would absolutely not want to sleep in the same room with them, but they're honestly great pieces. This guy is a Dark Souls 2 giant with finger bones pulling his face apart from the inside. This guy has teeth for eyes. These? These are aesthetic. I researched the paintings because they were so excellent and found that they were made for Hitman 2, along with several other pieces of environmental art by an artist named Stanton Feng. I wanted to call this out by name because they really catch my eye every time I play the level. Link to his art station in the description. The upstairs, including Raynard's bedroom, is surrounded by a rooftop walkway, connected to a large patio which overlooks the beach. There's also a rooftop zen garden here, and a stairwell leading both up and down. Going upstairs, you'll reach the rooftop, which includes various air conditioning and ventilation machinery, as well as the skylights throughout the house, which can be used to look down at locations such as the main room, the bathroom above the tub, and Raynard's bed. Finally, back down on the second floor, you can find your actual destination for this first empty portion of the level, an office containing Raynard's computer. When you first interact with the computer, you find it encrypted, and need a dongle in order to decrypt it. Diana quickly notes that the office is much bigger on the floor plan than it actually appears, which indicates there might be a secret room hidden somewhere. Side note, I love this life-sized golden skull Raynard is using as a paperweight. I want one. By tilting a painting, you can expose a secret door leading to a safe room filled with various weapons like guns, grenades, and even a katana and shurikens, as well as the security system which you can disable and erase, and a whiteboard detailing a plan Raynard and her men have to commit a kidnapping in the nearby city of Wellington. This is where you can find the dongle used to decrypt Raynard's computer. This safe room also has a stairwell leading to the hallway behind the garage, via a hidden one-way door. There are several documents you can find throughout the mission indicating who the next target for the militia may be, including one about the CEO of Dynasty Global, the Hitman universe's stand-in for Amazon. Once you're prepared, you can interact with the computer. Doing this will trigger a cutscene of 47 hacking the computer and transferring the information to Diana. Raynard doesn't have any information on the Shadow Client or 
any of the militia's other cells, which is what you came for, but they do find a message from Robert Knox of Kronstadt Industries. Knox has been spooked by all of the high-profile deaths of fellow Providence members in the first game, and is trying to defect to the Shadow Client's side before he's the next target. This, of course, makes him your next target instead. As 47 and Diana are speaking, a caravan of cars pulls up to the house and begins unloading. This is how we are introduced to Alma Raynard, the target of the mission, and her boyfriend Orson Mills. With Raynard now in strangling distance, the opportunity is too good to miss, and the objective of the mission is updated to take her out. Note that Mills is not a target here, and although the player can of course kill him, he canonically survives the mission and will show up again later on. As soon as this next section of the mission begins, the once empty house will now be crawling with bodyguards, and 47 will have to take cover and find a way to avoid them as they begin sweeping the house for intruders, immediately testing the player on how much attention they paid to the house's floor plan while it was still empty. The beach will now also be absolutely crawling with guards, and some of them will even pull the bodies of the two people from the van out in order to start digging a grave to hide them in. Another way in which this mission differs from the rest of the series is that while there are technically disguises in this mission... Well, actually, that's not true. There's disguise in this mission, no plural. You can get a bodyguard disguise. That's it. And it really doesn't help much, as both Raynard and Mills are enforcers for the disguise, as are many of the guards throughout the level. I'll be honest, I hardly ever put on a bodyguard disguise in this mission. This is a sneaking mission, and that's how I play it. While I would be upset if any other missions in the game worked that way, it works well in context here, and it's a lot of fun to have exactly one small mission that really strongly encourages you to do a suit-only run. I'm glad they don't do it again, but I like it just this once. Raynard is a great target, one of the secret ingredients that makes this mission so compelling. Raynard and Mills have a running rapport through the mission that is just excellent. There's a very callous, casual nature to her throughout the mission. I highly recommend tailing Raynard through her entire route once, if you've never done it before. It's one of my favorite performances in the series. We can learn what they and all of their guards just got back from doing by listening to Mills, who will ask her who they've just kidnapped. Raynard will casually explain that they've just kidnapped the family of the Vice President of Dynasty Global in London, in order to blackmail him into killing his boss, and you can even hear her doing this over the phone just a moment later. Mr. Donovan, who I am is not important. You have seen the pictures, yes? Good. I will tell you exactly what to do. Do it swiftly and without question, and your wife and children go free, unharmed. Refuse or hesitate, and your family dies. Attempt to signal or warn anybody, and your family dies. Do we have terms? Mm, not very convincing, Mr. Donovan. Take a deep breath and try again. The way the two slip between speaking of their horrible actions and the sort of casual chit-chat a couple would have after getting home late at night from dinner and a movie is really incredible. You will approach Mr. Pierce, lure him close to the edge, and toss him off the building. Hey, you want green tea or mango? What do you think? You heard me, Mr. Donovan. The life of your boss for the life of your wife and daughters. At the same time, while Raynard and Mills have both done awful things, there's something I find unsettling about this mission. A voyeuristic quality the games never hit again. Every Hitman mission provides a snapshot of the lives of these NPCs, 
but by giving these characters a strict path with a beginning and end, it makes the whole thing feel more alive to me. It gives the game this strange energy of being an intruder and listening into the personal details of these people's lives in a way they never hit again. Standing in a closet or below the window of a shower, watching a couple change or prepare for bed or share a cigarette before bed, is a singularly uncomfortable experience within these games, and I mean that in the best way possible. I found an anecdote on the Hitman fandom wiki, one which is of course unsourced, while researching this video that the developers had to tone down Raynard's outfit in the mission to keep Agent 47 from feeling like a sexual predator. And if that is true, then I totally see why. I, I see how it could come across that way. It's interesting because there are plenty of other targets in the series dressed quite provocatively, so IOI clearly aren't shy about it, but when you're stalking, for example, Lyudmila Vitrova in The Last Resort, it doesn't have this uncomfortable energy. That's because while you are infiltrating private spaces in the other missions, you're not overhearing what feels like private, intimate details in them, generally speaking. You're hearing the secret, dark machinations of supervillains, not hearing a couple bicker as they get ready for bed. I like to think of this level as a reverse slasher, a mission where it really feels like you're playing as Michael Myers or Norman Bates, quietly stalking your unsuspecting prey late at night. That's a cool energy to be able to hit so well. If you recall from the Colorado level, there are several references to Raynard as having just left the camp, being another prominent lieutenant of the militia on the same level as Sean Rose. Well, as we get more details about Raynard in the mission, it quickly becomes apparent that she and Sean Rose were in a long-term relationship with each other, a fact that Orson is very aware of and very bitter about. When Raynard enters the home, you can hear the house's smart computer say, Welcome home, Alma, and guest. It's Orson. Orson. Later, as the two of them are changing in the closet, you can hear him ask, So, uh, when are you going to tell the house about me? When am I what? You know what I mean. Welcome home, Alma. And guest. I'm staying here too, you know. Least you could do is teach it my name. Or maybe you don't expect to keep me around long enough to bother, is that it? I, um, didn't know it was that important to you, Orson. What can I say? My bad. I've been using the safe house for years. Right, you and Sean. Bet the house knew his name. Okay, I guess I could change it into... Welcome, Alma and Sean, too. <laughs> How's that? Hmm, funny. Or maybe second Sean. That has a nice ring to it, don't you think? Or Sean Light. <laughs> you know what, I'll think of some more while I go and brush my teeth. Fine. I'm gonna hit the shower. You do that, Orson. There are some other tense exchanges regarding Rose throughout their dialogue in a way that feels very lived in, very authentic. Not healthy, don't get me wrong, but very human. The voice acting in these games is so, so good, and it goes a long way into fooling your brain into thinking these stiff virtual puppets are real people, if only for a little while. These are the sorts of exchanges which make this mission compelling to me. Plus, the way you're watching the exact same situation play out over and over and over again, not just characters cycling through the same patrol route, but repeating the same lines of dialogue, living the same moments over and over again, give this level a real Majora's Mask appeal to me. That Majora's Mask appeal is something which I think this game often hits because of the way these levels are meant to be played over and over and the routines are meant to be internalized, but it never hits stronger than this. Raynard has done horrible things, but the way she acts in this level is so mundane, so humanizing, that killing her leaves so much more of a bittersweet impression on me than, say, killing Jordan Cross or Dahlia Margolis does. Not to mention, while she is a monster, 
We understand the context of her part in the war on Providence now, and any of the militia targets, as awful as they might be, do now have an undercurrent of being on the side of taking down Providence, which I see as a noble action. The Shadow Client's militia and Providence are both filled with awful people, but I know which side I'd rather see win this war, and not just because I've played the rest of this game and know more about Providence's crimes than we've already discussed. This is the first mission where Agent 47 and Diana's part in this conspiracy and the implications of the killings they're taking part in are fully understood, and they are not the good guys. Let's move along and talk about some of those opportunities to take Reynard out. There are no mission stories available for Night Call, but there are a number of very involved challenges and notable kills that serve a similar role to mission stories, so I'll talk about several of those here. The challenge, A Clean Kill, requires you to kill Raynard while her boyfriend, Orson Mills, is in the shower. If you wait until the steam from Orson's shower fogs up the windows, he'll be unable to see anything going on in the rest of the room, giving you plenty of time to take Raynard out and hide her body before he comes out to investigate. The challenge Sugar Honey Honey requires you to kill Raynard by poisoning her tea, more specifically by poisoning the sweetener in her tea, as Mills will make her a cup of tea when they first arrive home. While it's trivial to do this during the first segment while the house is empty, it's randomized whether Raynard will take sugar or honey in her tea, so you either need to find or bring enough poison to lace both, or leave it up to chance whether you've chosen appropriately. The challenge Sleep Tight requires you to kill Raynard with a pillow while she's sleeping. The trickiest part here is that, of course, she doesn't fall asleep the instant her head hits the pillow. You need to wait a moment until she's actually asleep, jumping the gun will get you seen and prevent you from completing the challenge. The challenge Contained Explosion requires you to kill a target with an explosion without killing or knocking out anyone else in the explosion. Smells Like Nail Polish is a challenge which requires you to kill Raynard by poisoning the ventilation system. This is hinted at by an answering machine message you can listen to on the bottom floor before everyone returns home. A message from someone at Kiwi Repair who needs to fix the ventilation system. Uh, Kiora, uh, Ari from Kiwi Repair here. Uh, don't know when you folks are back in town, but uh, give me a shout so I can swing by and uh, fix that pesky bathroom ventilation system for you. <laughs> I can't have the whole house smelling a nail polish now, can we? <laughs> uh, well, and anywho, like I said, uh, just give me a shout. That's Ari, uh, the repair guy. Raynard and Mills sleep directly below a large skylight, allowing them to sleep beneath the stars. Mr. Sandman requires you to kill Raynard by shooting her through the skylight while she's sleeping. Raynard will briefly step onto the balcony for a cigarette before going to sleep, providing a great chance for a sniper kill. There are a number of ninja-themed challenges in this map, such as Deadly Shadow, which requires essentially performing a suit-only run of the mission where you must kill a target with a katana while wearing your suit, without any bodies being found, or Deadly Ninja, which has you kill ten people in the level using only a katana and shurikens. Oh, and one of these, requiring you to pacify someone with the aquarium, is called Waterbender. Which, you know, it's like that one thing. Avatar. The Last Waterbender. Okay, are you ready for my favorite kill in the mission? If Raynard or the other NPCs in the mission become too suspicious, for example by finding a knocked out guard somewhere, then Raynard and Mills will run to the safe room in the mission. The safe room locks from the inside, and you can't access it again until the lockdown has been lifted. The ventilation system isn't working in the safe room, however, so there's a hatch on the ceiling which is just barely open a crack, which allows you to aim down and headshot Raynard while she's cowering, awarding the Like Fish in a Barrel challenge. But that's not the kill I'm referring to as my favorite. Oh no. 
If you're already in the panic room waiting for Raynard and Mills to arrive when they are put on lockdown, then you reveal yourself, then Raynard will flee the house entirely, moving all the way down to the beach near where some guards are burying the bodies of the two civilians from the van. If you continue to chase her, taking out guards protecting her along the way, which is easier said than done, then she'll move again to the stretch of beach right near Agent 47's boat. Finally, if you chase her here... Target down. Well done, 47. Now get off the property. Beautiful. One departure from the first game is that not every map in Hitman 2 and Hitman 3 have the same amount of mastery levels. In Hitman 2, the first map, Hawks Bay, has only five levels of mastery. This makes sense given how small the map is in comparison to the other missions. The other two maps with reduced mastery are the Whittleton Creek map later on in Hitman 2, which only has 15 levels of mastery, and the New York map from Hitman 2's DLC, which likewise only has 15 levels. For these missions, it makes less sense to only have 15 levels of mastery. Whittleton Creek in particular, while geographically smaller than most of the other maps in Hitman 2, is extremely dense with content and has a ton of challenges to complete, so easily could have supported 20 levels. They're both at least of the same scale as, say, the Paris or Bangkok maps, which both had 20 levels of mastery. The New York level is often criticized for feeling small, specifically in the context of the DLC being overpriced, which we'll get to down the line when we get there, but likewise, I feel like it's incredibly dense with content. I wasn't able to find a strict answer from an interview or something like that as to why these maps, particularly Whittleton, had these reduced mastery levels, only some speculation that Whittleton Creek may have had some cut content. Cut content makes the most sense to me, but that is just speculation, so again, if anyone does have a more concrete answer with a source, please let me know. Thankfully, Hitman 3 remedied this, and the Hitman 3 versions of both Whittleton Creek and New York have raised their mastery levels up to 20, in line with the rest. But for now, let's talk about the five levels that do exist in both versions of Hawks Bay. Aside from the typical starting locations and agency pickups, there are three items offered as rewards. A theme you'll notice is that a lot of the items now available from Mastery are Mark II versions of items we've already seen in the first game, cosmetic reskins that work the same way. For example, at level 2 of Mastery here, you get the ICA Proximity Explosive Mark II. Progress was not able to be carried forward from the first game to the second, even though the maps were available in both games, so for those who didn't want to replay the first game's missions in Hitman 2, or people coming to the second game without buying the pack containing the first game's content, this provides a good way to get important and useful items. At level 5, you unlock two more items, a flash grenade and a tanto. Next, let's talk about some easter eggs and details scattered throughout the mission. There are a lot of references to Max in this mission, Raynard's pet dog who typically keeps watch over the house. Guards can even mention that it may just be Max when they go to investigate a disturbance. I swear, if that's Ms. Raynard's thing again. Despite that, Max is never seen in the level, and no dogs exist in the trilogy. Down the beach, you can find several guards digging a grave for the dead bodies found in the garage during the first part of the mission. Their truck nearby is filled with gas cans and flares so they can burn the bodies before burying them. You can hear the guards discussing how the militia's operations have been going, including a full list of Providence operatives who have been taken down without your help at this point. Anyway, 
How many is that off the kill list? Let's see. Um, the boss took down Eugene Cobb, Milton Fitzpatrick CEO, and Thomas Cross, the media mogul, all on his own. And since the militia was formed, we've taken down five more of the bastards. That construction CEO in Shanghai, lady from Blue Seed Pharmaceuticals, Dan Zieger, the insurance mogul in Berlin, Barisan Martin, the retail giant, Rex Larson, the shipping king. And finally, tonight, we hit Rupert Pierce, CEO of Dynasty Global. <laughs> Can't wait to see that smug prick bite the pavement. Kidnapping the VP's family and blackmailing him to kill his own boss. I'm as sure as a scary brain sometimes. Yeah, question is, what's it all good for? What's it all good for? Providence is an octopus and we're tearing off its limbs one by one. Media, shipping, pharma, now online retail. Even if they do kill us all, Providence will spend years repairing the damage. Besides, Orson says one of their operatives is ready to defect. Knox, the tech guy? Nah, we got them sons of bitches rattled. Sooner or later, we'll get to someone who knows the higher-ups, and then whack. Yeah, unless nobody knows anything and we're basically chasing ghosts. Shit, they're not gods, Nash. Just clever suits. They can't be completely untraceable. If there's a weak link, and trust me, there is, the boss will find it. And if the two of you don't dig faster, we'll have a crab buffet on our hands. Just saying. Ugh. There are a couple of challenges involving killing Orson Mills rather than Raynard. Specifically, Death of a Statesman, which requires you to poison Orson's whiskey bottle with a lethal dose of poison, and Orson Bathes, which asks you to kill Orson Mills with a kitchen knife while he's in the shower. As with the A Clean Kill challenge, waiting until steam has fogged up the shower's glass will make Raynard unable to see the murder take place. When she eventually does notice that Mills has stopped responding, she'll show much less concern than her partner did when the roles were reversed. Orson? Or- <sighs> Never mind. Shampoo in his ears. Speaking of Orson, he's one of the trilogy's recurring NPCs, who can be found in several missions, although unlike characters like Andrea Martinez, he never appears as the main target of a story mission. I'm just going to cover him here, although I'll briefly call out his appearances again later on. Chronologically, after this mission, he next appears as a mercenary in the mission Shadows in the Water on Ambrose Island where he's working as the second-in-command for Noel Crest, a member of the Shadow Client's militia who splintered off into its own rogue faction. His final appearance in the main missions is in the very final mission of the trilogy, Untouchable, where he has actually defected to Providence and is working as a commando for them. I mention this now because I really like the foreshadowing here of Orson's tenuous allegiance to the Shadow Client's militia, first following Noel Crest's splinter faction and then defecting to Providence, since it does feel like it would make sense he would defect if he thought that's the way the wind was blowing, especially after, from his perspective, the Shadow Client's agenda got his lover killed. Oh. I'm, uh, I'm supposed to rendezvous with the team in Riga, like, five days from now? I've got no idea what the mission is or who my teammates are. Like, all this secrecy is starting to get on my nerves. You know the boss. Belt and suspenders kind of guy. Well, I don't. And neither do you. That's kind of my, uh, that's kind of my point. Call me old-fashioned, but like I say, uh, I like to know who I'm risking my life for. You know why? The rest are details. It's easy for you to say. At least you're in the loop. I take orders just like you. In fact, the boss deliberately keeps me out of the loop. I don't even know who the other cells are. Compartmentalization is key. Yeah, I guess. But that's Sean new. I also just generally like the very petty characterization of Orson here, his frustration with Raynard and his jealousy towards Sean Rose, Raynard's former lover, and the father of Raynard's child. Orson also has a non-canon appearance as the target of The Mills Reverie, a special Halloween-themed escalation mission set within his nightmares, where you play as a sort of jack-o'-lantern demon stalking and tormenting him. 
One detail I completely missed back in Freedom Fighters is that if you tail Sean Rose long enough, you can hear him call Raynard and discuss how things are going with her, including his perspective on some of his fellow targets in the mission. Interestingly, the one he's actually the most openly irritated with is not Penelope Graves, but Maya Parvati. Alma. Not too well. Everyone knows. They just don't know how bad. I, I keep it under control, but everything's... It's a goddamn struggle. In my old groups, there was... Unity. Everyone agreed on everything. But this... Bunch... What unites them? Apart from the urge to tear everything down and stick it to the powers that be. Parvati's the worst of them. If she keeps sapping my authority, I'll have to get rid of her. At least Graves got potential. If only she can get past her pedestrian sense of morality. Sure. Go do your thing. We'll talk later. When you first enter the house, you find a projector left on, playing the news. Sitting and watching the broadcast, you can hear updates on the aftermath of several of the missions from the first game, as well as references and foreshadowing to events still to come. You can hear that Millennium Records are releasing the class's second album, the one they were recording during Club 27 as a posthumous release for Jordan Cross, as well as an update on what the other band members are up to since. Teen fans are barely out of their mourning period, but today Monumental Records announced a new record release by synth rock sensation The Class. Jordan Cross, the class charismatic yet tormented frontman, who died under mysterious circumstances during the recording of the band's much anticipated sophomore album, left behind three brand new tracks, which Monumental planned to release as an EP. The label spokesperson calls the move a loving tribute to a shining star extinguished much too soon. Meanwhile, Heidi Santoro, the class guitarist and longtime creative partner of Cross, calls the release a shameless money grab. Santoro, who left Monumental shortly after Jordan Cross's death, is working on a solo release of her own, along with ex-class drummer Quentin Moriarty. There's a reference to The Last Yardbird, the final member of the Yardbird Gang of Thieves, being apprehended, which is a reference to one of the missions of the sniper assassin mode of Hitman 2, The Last Yardbird, which I'll talk about later on in this series. In Panama City, Interpol agents have arrested the last surviving member of the legendary gang of thieves known as the Yardbirds. Alexander Kovac, a Serbian native, was attempting to convert close to 50 million US dollars into bitcoins, the spoils of the Yardbird's spectacular final casino heist. And now, nations are lining up to prosecute Kovac, including Russia, Germany, the US, and Austria, where Kovac is the prime suspect in a triple murder at a wedding ceremony. There's news about an upcoming Cassandra Snow film, which is the first one not based on one of the hit novels by the late author Craig Black, a reference to the author mission from the Patient Zero campaign. And good news for urban fantasy fans! The upcoming Cassandra Snow movie, Tears of the Wolf, was announced today. The sixth installment in the record-breaking teen fantasy franchise, which will be filmed exclusively in New Zealand, finds the eponymous Snow in a perilous parallel dimension where she must destroy the mystical source of lycanthropy across the multiverse and save her new boyfriend Jared from the curse of the blood moon. This is the first Cassandra Snow movie that is not based on the best-selling books by late author Craig Black, and some critics do fear that the franchise will take a radical departure from the source material, 
Only time will tell, but at least the scenery will be stunning. You can hear about Kronstadt Industries' Gamma AI robot losing its first patient on the operating table, a reference to the Cytus Inversus mission, as well as see an early cameo of Robert Knox. In Japan, Kronstadt Industries' much-hailed surgery robot, nicknamed the Spider, has lost its first patient on the operating table. The Gamma Medical Facility has released a statement insisting that the tragic incident was due to human error. Nevertheless, this comes as bad news for the consumer tech giant, which is still reeling from last year's PR disaster, where stolen Kronstadt fighting drones were employed by Katanyang dictator Jin Po against peaceful civilians in the Tungan Valley Massacre. So far, Kronstadt has been silent about the incident. But CEO Robert Knox is expected to make a statement early next week. Finally, if you wait until Reynard has reached the bedroom after brushing her teeth, the broadcast will cut to breaking news that a man has fallen from the roof of Dynasty Global Headquarters, revealing that Reynard's blackmail worked perfectly. Stupid In Max. downtown London, a man has allegedly plummeted to his death from the headquarters of Dynasty Global the world's largest internet retailer. While the identity is unconfirmed, several eyewitness tweets claim that the deceased is none other than Rupert Pierce, Dynasty's founder and CEO. We will keep you updated as this story develops. I am Pam Kingsley, GNN News. Well, that's that. Smoke on the balcony? Yeah, sure. How about a scotch? No, I just brush my teeth. The reporter reading all of these stories is Pam Kingsley, the same reporter who interviewed Klaus Strandberg during a mission story back in A Gilded Cage. You can close the blinds of various windows in the house if you want more privacy, and to obscure what's going on inside the house from those bodyguards outside of it. You can see Raynard take off her beret and place it on a hat rack when she first enters the level. It's a nice animation, I like that little touch. One of the guards in the mission was also present during Freedom Fighters, and can be overheard talking about how unsettling it was to realize someone had slipped into a highly secure base, killed four trained operatives, and disappeared without leaving a trace. That's the thing I can't get out of my head. I never heard a thing. Not even saw the shadows move. And then they just started dropping like flies. Berg, Rose. Kavadi, Graves, one after the other. It's like Death himself was stuck in the camp. This guy, he could have walked straight past me. Never felt anything was amiss. You can't begin to imagine how that feels, man. Like your instincts are suddenly worth shit. Hey, don't do this to yourself, man. The way Alma tells it, this guy, he's in a different league altogether. I'll say. How'd he do it, though? That's the thing that drives me mad. I gotta know how this guy strolled into a heavily fortified compound, took out four experienced operatives without so much as raising the alarm, and vanished without leaving a fucking trace. Ah, he got lucky. That's all there is to it. Now put it out of your mind. He could be here. If he was there, why not here? And we'd never even know it. You can listen to guards just outside the house discussing more details of the mission they just went on, including how the kidnapping itself went down. So Alma and Orson infiltrate this party at the Prime Minister's. Meanwhile, the team stands by in the sewers below. During a cello performance, Alma sneaks off and shuts down the estate's security systems. And while everyone's eyes are somewhere else, we swoop in, grab the mark, and her kids, sedate them, and poof, we're gone. Like clockwork. Nice. Where'd you stash them? Old barn. About 20 miles from here. Kids must be terrified. We're not gonna hurt them. Not if the husband does what he's told. And if he tries to be a hero? Yeah, then that's a different situation. Providence can't think we're soft. It'll endanger the whole plan. I thought the boss said no innocent civilians. Leaders say a lot of things. For the people on the ground to interpret. You can hear Raynard and Mills talking about Knox defecting while they're smoking on the balcony before bed. That reminds me. I need you to do something for me. Okay. What's the gig? It's a cakewalk, really. I just need you and the boys to pick up a shipment in Brussels three days from now. A truckload of cutting-edge Kronstadt Industries military hardware. Drones and shit. You'll get a kick out of it, I promise. Well, shit, the Noxes really are defecting. High-level Providence stooges like them? That's a real feather in your cap. 
So why aren't you the one doing the honors? See, there's just a teensy possibility that it could be a trap. And if it is, well, I'm too important to risk. Wow. Don't start. No, no, I get it. Everyone's expendable, but some are more expendable than others. Is that it? I wouldn't put it on a t-shirt, but, well, yeah. In a nutshell. Fine, I'll do it. I know you can hold your own and all that, but I want you to be safe, Alma. I mean, I'd hate it if... Oh, geez, it's chilly out here. If you wait for a full 15 minutes after Raynard and Mills have gone to sleep, then you can see Raynard wake up to go take a phone call on the balcony from her sister, who is scolding her for missing her daughter's birthday party. This also reveals that Sean Rose was the father of her child. Oh, shit. It's me. I know it was her birthday. I forgot. What do you want me to say? I'm an international fugitive. I don't have time for silly bourgeois. <sighs> Sorry. Long day. So, how's Mercedes? Oh, did she get that role in the school play? Unicorn? Huh. Wait, front end or back end? <laughs> That's my girl. Well, there's not a whole lot I can do about that, is there? I chose my path a long time ago, Thelia. Long before the kid was ever even born. She's more yours than mine at this point. Besides, this thing I'm doing now, it's important. It will change things. I gotta believe that. I know you don't approve of my methods, like you never approved of Dad's, but... <laughs> Look, just tell her to break a leg, okay? Bye, sis. <sighs> Fire in blanks my ass. Thanks a bunch, Sean. There are other references to Sean Rose in the mission, like two guards on the roof who refer to Raynard and Rose's Bonnie and Clyde days of committing acts of eco-terrorism together. Ooh, fancy place. Well, I suppose Alma has one hell of an expense account. How much did the boss loot from that cross guy? Was it three billion? Something like that. But actually, this is Alma's old safe house, from her Bonnie and Clyde days with Sean Rose. Huh. Guess left-wing terrorism pays better than you think. Yeah, that or she shot the owner. Still, I gotta say, this is a swanky place to lay low. It's got a house AI and voice control and everything. Kick-ass security system, too. Of course, she never turns it on because of Max. Apparently, he's so big, the sensors treat him as an intruder. Why not just lock him in the garage? <laughs> Orson tried that, and, uh... Well, Max ate the tires on his SUV and half a bicycle. <laughs> no, Max doesn't like to be tied down. Well, they do say pets take after their owners. As a reminder, in Freedom Fighters, New Zealand is said to be the location where the bombings that resulted in the deaths of children took place, which have made Rose so unpopular with his own men. I encountered a funny glitch in the Hitman 3 version of the map, where a water texture on the beach was accidentally placed incorrectly, hovering several feet above the ground. Once you've taken Raynard out, you still need to escape the area. Unlike most missions, there is only one exit here, the same boat which 47 entered the mission on. By the time you've snuck back onto the beach, the guards will have discovered the boat and will be on high alert combing the beach for intruders. Getting past most of them to reach the boat requires careful use of the foliage on the beach to hide, which was a new system introduced in Hitman 2. If you know how to use the foliage, it's not all that hard to reach the boat, but once there, three guards will be inspecting the boat, making it impossible to get into it and leave. The exit is even locked as long as the guards are still there. Of course, you could kill them all, but Diana suggests a more elegant solution. Hmm, no way to get past them unnoticed. I suggest you cause a distraction, 47, and make it a loud one. Nearby, just up the beach, you can find the truck carrying gasoline and flares, which the guards are using to burn the bodies of the two civilians found in the garage earlier on. By shooting the gas can, you can set off all of the flares, and cause the truck to catch fire. This will cause enough of a distraction that the guards investigating your boat will run to the truck 
giving you a chance to escape. There are other ways of doing this too, of course. Setting off a nearby car alarm by shooting it will cause everyone to turn around, which can give you just enough of a window to leave the mission. My favorite way to draw the guards away from the boat, though, is by taking one of the frag grenades from Raynard's safe room further down the beach. As soon as it goes off, all three of the guards will draw their weapons to go investigate the explosion, making it easy to slip past them and escape the level. Overall, I consider Nightcall to be the most underrated gem in the entire trilogy. I love everything about this mission. I love the target, I love the environment, I love the calls back and calls forward to other missions in the trilogy, I love the little exchanges between Raynard and Mills. There's really nothing about this mission I don't like. It's certainly the smallest mission in scope in Hitman 2, and one of the smallest missions in the entire trilogy, only really being bigger than the two tutorial missions of Hitman 1 and the final mission of Hitman 3, but it uses that small scale to provide an incredibly focused experience. I also think this mission might just be the most gorgeous in the entire trilogy. The beach sections have an incredible sense of atmosphere, from watching the soft glow of the lighthouse in the distance or the dark storm clouds gently drift by, to the modern architecture of the house bathed in the light of the projector, to even the smallest details, like how lovingly rendered the cloth physics on the curtains in the pool house are. Everything about the way this mission looks just resonates with me down in my very bones. This mission is short and unassuming compared to the absolute behemoths we have coming up over the rest of Hitman 2, but the amount of depth here is absolutely stellar. The target and her relationship to not only Mills, but Sean Rose is fascinating. She actually manages to make Rose more interesting than he was in Freedom Fighters, purely in retrospect. Nightcall manages to perfectly capture the spirit of what makes these games so special, despite its small and sparsely populated nature. In fact, it manages to take that size and lack of NPCs and use it to its advantage, providing a completely different kind of appeal from any other mission in the game, while still feeling like a coherent part of the World of Assassination trilogy as a whole. Overall, while Nightcall isn't as flashy as many of the other missions yet to come in Hitman 2, it's an incredibly strong start for the game, and a mission worth going back to and trying to clear more challenges and get more difficult kills in if you only played it once and then moved on to the bigger missions. You can spend a lot of time on this mission, and even years later, I find it as one of my go-to missions when I feel like playing a short session of Hitman to relax. It's an incredibly fun, bite-sized piece of Hitman content, which encourages players to try experimenting with new playstyles they may not have previously engaged with. An absolutely stellar opening to one of my favorite games of all time. Once you complete the mission and escape, you're treated to a cutscene called Blank Check. One of the cuts clearly made in order to scale back the budget of the second game was the cutscenes. Gone are the motion capture full CG cinematics replaced with... They're kind of like motion comics? You know the scenes in Bayonetta where the budget runs out, so now the characters go from these high-energy, campy action scenes to these weird and uncanny, mostly still images with characters talking over them? These are like one step up from those. That sounds really mean, but I actually don't mind these. They get across what they need to visually, and are still a compelling means of moving the story forward. And as far as places to cut the budget, they chose correctly. If changing the cutscenes from expensive motion-captured scenes to simpler motion comics is what it took to ensure that the levels in Hitman 2 feel uncompromised, and in fact feel bigger and better than before, then sign me up for some motion comics. Agent 47 is standing in a hotel room in Wellington, looking at the photo of himself as a child which Diana was given by the Constant at the end of the last game. It seems to trigger a disjointed memory in him. 
Diana calls and says that New Zealand impressed Providence enough that they've provided the ICA with a blank check with which to track down and eliminate the rest of the militia. A week ago, Providence was a threat. How did you swing the board? The board are practical people, 47. A blank check is hard to turn down. Besides, the Shadow Client's war on Providence is causing a global panic. Someone will need to stop the militia. Might as well be us. And the man on the train? You never told them about his offer. Taking a contract for personal gain is against ICA regulations. Sodas would have been proud. Is that a sense of humor, 47? Whatever next, crying at the movies? I love the exchange where 47 says Soders would be proud, and Diana makes a note of the uncharacteristic sarcasm. This is a touch of foreshadowing for Agent 47's arc over the rest of the trilogy. He has an emotionless affectation, but he is still human, and this game and its sequel are going to explore that. Why are you doing this? I know what it's like to have everything taken from you. Put a pin in that, because that's going to be a very important note for the rest of the series. He claims to know about your past, your childhood, your memories, everything Ortmeier stole from you. And you trust him? About as far as I can throw him. But this is our best lead in 20 years. I say it's time we break a few rules. They know that the Constant and Providence are not to be trusted, but they also know that this is their first and only lead on 47's past since Dr. Ortmeier, the man who created 47, died. And so for now, they'll play Providence's game. Next time, we'll see 47 and Diana make an example out of a Providence defector, and see just how big the maps in Hitman 2 have grown at a racetrack in Miami. If you're still watching this, then I'd like to say thank you. It's been a lot longer between the first and second seasons of Hit Me Baby 47 more times than I'd intended, and I appreciate everyone being patient. I know some people have been concerned that I was fully pivoting the channel away from Hitman content because of the hiatus, but I fully intend on covering all of Hitman 2 and 3. There's just been a lot of personal stuff going on in the past year that you don't need to hear about, which has been delaying these videos. Also, the other reason this took so long is because at a certain point, I wasn't happy with how this episode was turning out, so I threw out what I had, even though it was mostly finished and started over. And I'm certain now that was the right choice, because I'm much more satisfied with the final product than I was with that scrapped version. I'm glad that you guys have shown patience and understanding when I need to take long breaks like that, and I hope you can trust me when I say it results in a better product. On a positive note, the channel and my audience is looking a lot different now from what it looked like last time I made an episode in this series. I had just passed 100 subscribers when the last episode came out, and now, a year later, I'm sitting at 13.8k as of writing this, which is really crazy. So, I do want to talk a little bit frankly about the future of this series going forward. For the first season of Hitman videos, I was able to stay on a more or less monthly release schedule, with one big hiatus in the middle there. I really wanted to be able to stay on a monthly release schedule for the second season, covering Hitman 2, but while working on this video and the next installment covering Miami, which I've been working on in parallel, I've realized that the Hitman 2 missions are just so big and overwhelming to cover that staying on a monthly release schedule isn't realistic. So I'm not going to hold to a strict monthly release schedule for Season 2, because I think it'll be best both for my own mental health and the quality of the videos to give myself the time I need between episodes and to work on other content in between these videos. That might mean it goes two months or three months between episodes here, with other content like videos covering Final Fantasy or indie horror games in between, but I really do think it's going to result in better videos. I want to be putting out the best videos possible, especially for Hitman 2, because it is my favorite game in the series, and the next mission, Miami, is specifically my favorite mission in the series. So thank you everyone for your support and your patience waiting for more videos to come. I'm really excited to share more of my thoughts on these games with you. 
The next Hitman video that I'm going to put out is actually going to be a supercut of all of the episodes covering the first game, with some revisions, corrections, and additions. Things I missed which have been pointed out to me as I've been covering the games. I think it'll be a really good way for new people to get a chance to see the full series. I've got that video half edited already, it's just going to end up being like 10 hours long, so it's taking a while, but that should be up soon. Please, if you enjoy this video and this series, consider leaving a like, commenting, subscribing, you know the drill. And hey, maybe think about sharing this video or other videos in this series with your friends. Finally, I'd like to thank my patrons who have pledged their real-life hard-earned cash to help me keep making these videos. That's all. Alex, Bell Mage, Malachi Murphy, Dunio, Lucos Craden. A heartfelt thank you to everyone who has enjoyed my channel enough to keep me going. I've recently started a Patreon for the channel where I'll be posting exclusive videos, serving as companions to some of the videos here on the main channel. Currently, the first video I've posted there covers The King in Yellow, the 1895 Robert W. Chambers short story collection. I think it's pretty fun, and if that sounds good to you, consider checking it out. Patreon.com slash Zuldim. There will be another companion video going up there before long, and the next one will be Hitman related. I'm not going to charge for the actual normal episodes of this series covering the levels of Hitman 2 or 3 or anything like that though, so don't worry that I'm going to be like, oh hey, you want to hear about the Columbia level? That'll be five dollars, please. I'm not going to do that to you. Once again, thank you to my patrons, thank you to anyone still watching. It means the absolute world to me that I'm able to share things I love with people and that people actually enjoy listening. I'm Zuldem, and I'll see you soon in Miami.